As well as you know U.S. history, you probably don't know that the U.S. Congress was officially abolished in 1859. After decades of corruption, its powers were stripped and its members were effectively banned from governing the people of the United States. All former members of Congress were told to evacuate the Capitol, effective immediately. All who did not comply with this request would be forcibly removed from the premises by the commanding general of the United States Army, Winfield Scott. In a critique that will sound very familiar to you, Congress was denounced for all of its fraud and corruption that prevented a fair and proper expression of the public voice. It was scolded for the nation's growing civil unrest, which it had promoted with its own open violation of the law. This decree condemned all of the government chaos caused by mobs, parties, factions, and the undue influence of political sex, so that the citizen has not the protection of person and property which he is entitled. In reading this document today, which was originally released in October 1859, it sounds as relevant as ever. When Congress refused to disperse and the integrity of the nation appeared to have crossed a point of no return, the Republic itself was dissolved. Just 84 years after the founding of America, the Republic of these United States was ended with the following decree. Whereas it is necessary for our peace, prosperity, and happiness as also to the national advancement of the people of the United States, that they should dissolve the Republican form of government and establish in its stead an absolute monarchy. Now therefore we, Norton I, by the grace of God Emperor of the 33 states and the multitude of territories of the United States of America, do hereby dissolve the Republic of the United States and it is hereby dissolved. The reason you've never heard of this decree, and the reason the American Republic survived, is that the only person who ever acknowledged the sovereign monarchy of Emperor Norton I was Norton himself. Though he never acquired any official power, the emperor became the unofficial mascot of the young city of San Francisco which had been incorporated only 10 years earlier, in 1850. The gold rush of 1849 had grown the population from 1,000 to 25,000 in a single year. And a large cast of colorful characters began to fill the city in their search for gold. Sailors and adventurers from around the world changed the identity of that region Overnight, the mood of the city was defined by the frenzy that had populated it so quickly, with the kind of people who would risk everything for a fortune. Ships full of speculators would dock in San Francisco and empty out into the California hills. At one point, there were more than 500 abandoned ships in San Francisco Harbor, left there by treasure hunters who had gone all in on the prospect of becoming millionaires. Many of these ships were eventually sunk and others were claimed by squatters. But the point is simply that San Francisco in the 1850s was a crazy place filled with fanatical people. It may be that no city in the world was so well suited to celebrate a man like Emperor Norton as this California boomtown. At the very limits, of Western civilization. You can't chase gold as recklessly as the people of San Francisco without developing a pretty good sense of humor. You can't live on that knife's edge between bankruptcy and millions for very long without realizing the absurdity of human existence. In a setting like that, the arbitrary nature of things like success and failure and even of institutions like government authority comes into focus 
and everything starts to feel like a bit of a joke. So, when Joshua Norton, a failed English businessman who lost his fortune on Peruvian rice speculation, declared himself, by the power vested in himself, by himself, the first emperor of a nation, currently led by one of the worst presidents in American history, James Buchanan. The people loved it. As far as they were concerned, Norton's self-coronation made about as much sense as anything the actual government was doing. So they celebrated it as a form of outrageous political commentary. The actual declaration of Norton's monarchy was distributed to a handful of local newspapers and read as follows. At the request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States, and in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in musical hall of this city. On the first day of February, next, then and there, to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union, as may ameliorate the evils under which the country is laboring, and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. Signed, Norton I, Emperor of the United States. The comedy of Norton, drawing his authority from this tiny loop of circular reasoning, along with his suggestion that he was only taking the role of emperor at the request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, made him an immediate hit with the local population. Additionally, the thought that the leader of the United States would come from this lawless outpost was a joke. All San Franciscans enjoyed. The gold rush had brought to the city a wave of criminal activity and a large criminal class. San Francisco was the wildest of the Wild West, and right behind the people who came to find gold were people who came to rob and murder the people that found gold. And then, of course, gamblers, pimps, and prostitutes who came to profit off all of this new money in less violent ways. This rather surreal city immediately understood the surreal humor of Norton's brash proclamations. He became a kind of mascot for the city and a kind of symbolic middle finger to the rest of the country who was poorly governed and quickly spiraling into the chaos of civil war. And unlike the actual officials of government, Norton was accessible every day of the week without appointment, due to the fact that he had no office or actual work to which to tend. He could be found on any given day wandering the city, inspecting sidewalks and street lamps, and just about every other aspect of public life. He was especially fond of inspecting the police force, at least among those officers who were good-natured enough to play along. And even if you had never met Norton or seen his picture, he was easy to spot, as he actually dressed like an emperor. As one historian describes him, he was always clad in a blue military uniform with the pollets of exaggerated size, and he wore a tall beaver hat, at the front of which was a brass rosette holding a gorgeous plum of gray-collared feathers. There was always a rosebud in his lapel and a regal sword at his belt, stocky of build with a heavy mustache and a finely pointed beard. He was truly the sight of a benevolent monarch. Yet Norton ate at soup kitchens in full imperial garb, having lost his fortune on financial speculation. In order to solve his cash shortage, he found one infallible way of making money, which was simply to make money, as in he actually created 
his own money, as every emperor has a right to do. He printed his own Americ currency with his image on it, and backed by the imperial government of Norton I. Better yet, many businesses around the city actually accepted these notes as legal tender, but only from him. On a side note, some of these notes are still around, and when they surface at auctions, they draw heavy bidding and huge prices. One 50-cent note can sell for tens of thousands of dollars. But while many were happy to support the unofficial mascot of San Francisco, not everyone was in on the joke. In 1867, Norton was arrested by a private security force on charges of madness for the purposes of committing him to what was called in those days an asylum for the insane. The public response to this arrest was swift and overwhelming. The citizens of San Francisco demanded Norton's release and put so much pressure on law enforcement that the San Francisco police chief not only released Norton, but also issued a formal apology. Protesting the arrest, one paper, the Daily Alta, pointed out that Norton had never robbed or beaten anyone, which was more than could be said for the actual government. As they put it, he had shed no blood, robbed no one, and despoiled no country, which is more than can be said of his fellows in that line. And Norton knew how to play to the home crowd. In one proclamation, he made it illegal to refer to his hometown as simply Frisco, a name the locals found annoying, in the same way that people from Orange County tend to hate references to the O.C. The condemnation read, Whoever after due and proper warning shall be heard to utter the abominable word Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant, shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor and shall pay into the imperial treasury as penalty the sum of $25. But there were also times when Norton I behaved like an actual visionary leader, as in his dealings with the immigrant population of his city. In the late 19th century, anti-Chinese sentiment in California was at an all-time high. Vast numbers of Chinese had settled in California, and especially San Francisco, during the gold rush. And their presence in the region led to widespread resentment. White residents began to feel threatened by the success of these outsiders, and an actual anti-Chinese political party emerged. The Working Men's Party of California, WPC. The party slogan was simply, The Chinese Must Go. Norton, as you might imagine, was having none of it. He would show up at WPC rallies to protest their violence and racist rhetoric and to defend the Chinese. While he showed his character in these moments, his lack of official authority prevented him from effectively combating racial violence. As much as they loved Norton, San Franciscans hated the Chinese even more. The murder and mistreatment of Chinese Americans sadly continued, and two years after Norton's death, the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act would be implemented by the U.S. government, prohibiting all Chinese immigration and naturalization to the United States. Along with his opposition to government corruption, Norton also supported women's right to vote, and he demanded that African Americans be allowed to ride public streetcars and that they be admitted to public schools. But here again, Norton was a lonely voice in a deeply troubled time, and nothing came of his proclamations. His most enduring legacy, beyond the memory of his larger-than-life personality, is his proposal for the construction of both a bridge and a tunnel between the cities of Oakland and San Francisco. More than 60 years later, his dream for a bridge would be realized in the form of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. And more than a hundred years later, his tunnel would become the Trans Bay Tube. Because of his incredible foresight for these projects, there is currently a movement 
to rename the Bay Bridge in his honor. On January 8, 1880, Norton suffered a stroke on his way to a night lecture at the Academy of Natural Sciences. He died on the sidewalk while a passerby frantically called for help. The following morning, the San Francisco call reported his death as dramatically as he might have hoped. On the reeking pavement in the darkness of a moonless night, under the dripping rain, Norton I, by the grace of God, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, departed this life. The San Francisco Chronicle headlined its own obituary with the simple phrase, Le Wa Imor, in English, The King is Dead. Upon learning that their emperor had died in poverty and was going to be buried in a simple coffin, the businessmen of San Francisco bought an ornate casket and paid for a stately funeral that was attended by more than 10,000 people who lined the streets for a funeral procession more than two miles long. According to the Chronicle, so many people attended the funeral that policemen were called in to regulate the entrance. In the words of that paper, the visitors included all classes, from capitalists to the pauper, the clergyman to the pickpocket, well-dressed ladies and those whose garb and bearing hinted of the social outcast. However, the garb of the laboring man predominated. Other major newspapers around the country reported on the funeral and the Cincinnati Inquirer referred to Norton as an emperor without enemies, a king without a kingdom, supported in life by the willing tribute of a free people. On reading of Norton's death in the New York Times, Mark Twain, who knew Norton from his time in San Francisco, wrote to the editor of the Atlantic Monthly, What an odd thing it is that neither Frank Soule nor Charlie Warren Stoddard, nor I, nor Bret Hart the immortal Bilk, nor any other professionally literary person in San Francisco has ever written up the Emperor Norton. Oh dear, it was always a painful thing for me to see the Emperor begging, for although nobody else believed he was an Emperor, he believed it. Though Twain never wrote a formal biography of Norton, he was the inspiration behind the character of the King in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The King got out an old ratty deck of cards after breakfast, and him and the Duke played seven up a while. Other authors, like Robert Louis Stevenson and Neil Gaiman, have also based characters on this king without a kingdom. Today, Norton is almost forgotten in the corruption of Congress, which he tried in vain to abolish, continues more or less unabated. And all of the national chaos that Norton campaigned against, caused by mobs, parties, factions, and the undue influence of political sex is as prevalent as ever. But remembering the emperor reminds us that our problems are not new, and that sometimes the only victories that emerge from troubled times, like our own, are not major political breakthroughs, but small, strange, and often inexplicable triumphs of the human spirit. In our next episode, we'll head in the opposite direction, to the godforsaken French showman and show-eater Tarari, who was a misfit of an altogether different kind.